side of your life is any hood. For those of you who cannot wait and love daddyhood, please head over to our Patreon. We have exclusive access to episodes. We have early access to episodes and we have behind the scenes footage. Head on over there, sign up, be part of the exclusive daddyhood group and join us over there. All right, welcome back to Daddyhood, Path to Parenthood. I'm so excited. This next guest needs no introduction. I have no note cards, no bio, no anything. Good luck. Welcome, my husband. Hi, babe. Jordan C. Brown. Do 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 do. I know you're so sad that we don't get to play the theme music. I love here. your theme song. It's so good. It's the best part of the podcast. Not not me, not my guests. It's the song. To be, I mean, it's all A plus. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for letting me turn our office into the studio. Um, the dogs hate it, but I don't mind it at all. I know. So as you know, I'm working on my dad jokes. I feel like I'm going to be the one that's going to have to give them dad jokes because you're going to have probably actually good jokes. <sighs> so with that being said, it's joke time. Okay. Here we go. Jordan, what has hands... But can't clap. Um, a clock. You're so good. That was like a riddle. That wasn't even a dad joke. Uh, all right. Well, I'm excited to fill everybody in on everything. So one of the first topics and conversations that we bonded over was our want and desire to become fathers. For sure. So we decided to get started. And I know, and I've talked openly on the podcast about my experience of going into California fertility partners and like getting the ball rolling and how overwhelming it was and also how it's taken now two years to get to the point where we're at. Well, what's your experience been like? My experience with fertility has been, I think it would have been more intense had we not had so many other huge life things happening at the same time. We were planning our wedding then we got married and we remodeled our house and we were really busy with work and family stuff and travel we adopted a dog yeah and we have two dogs and so I guess what I was surprised by is yeah it took a long time but how many different pieces of the puzzle there are and how you it's sort of like any other thing where you're like a customer even though it's so personal where you kind of have to like manage the different pieces of it and be like, hello, haven't heard from you in a couple weeks. What's going on? Um, <clears throat> and some of it's kind of funny, you know, like, yeah, this person, we don't know what happened to them. Like they never called us back and you're like, okay, that was going to be our egg donor or, you know, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, people are very sweet. It does feel a little clinical and impersonal sometimes because it's like, there's like, it's where the medical meets like, I don't know, like, almost like a, the miracle of life. Yeah. Which also meets like capitalism and money and they don't all go together that well. So it's a little bit, it's, it's a little bit of a weird thing, but it's also really rewarding. Yeah. I had Dr. Wingler on and I remember cause he was walking through the story where he's basically like, Jordan, you have 50 million sperm. Colton. <laughs> and I, I've been telling the story wrong the entire time. By the way, I thought I, he said I only had five. I only had four. Sperm, really? In which three of them were completely moveless or immobile. Immobile. Immobile is so many big words. Yeah. And I had one that was like barely wiggling. That would have been our miracle baby. But I mean, I just remember when he broke that news to me. I mean, you were there. You put your hand on my thigh so sweetly and were like there for me. But they, it was just like, okay. And then moving on. And I'm like, yeah. Wait, hold on. It was Can like we... 11 a.m. on a Tuesday. I know, and I had to take the rest of the day off work because I was just like, I can't. Can't. Well, do it's insane. It's everyone. Most people are really ignorant about all fertility stuff, and you know, there are so many things in culture where people associate being like virile. Like, how much sperm you have does not correlate to how manly you are, how masculine you are, but it's. Sometimes people might think that. I told him that too. I was like, I thought since I was on testosterone and I was doing mm. all these things that I would have great sperm. Come to find out everything that I thought was giving me good sperm killed my sperm. And then you went on alpha sperm. <laughs> and I went on alpha sperm. But now I'm on Which venatal. so funny. But good product. So, I know. Very good. It, wor- it worked. All right. I think just I want to back up. So I'm, I recently come out. 
we get together and I say, hey, I want to become a dad, what was your initial reaction? Well, I always wanted to have kids too. And I didn't, I don't know, it just never felt fast with you, even though it sort of was. I think, you know, everyone around us who mattered to us was like, you guys are doing great, you know? We were engaged for a year and a half. Yeah. Um, you know, so it wasn't that fast. I mean, it was fast, but um, I think also until we transferred the embryo in last week, it wasn't, you know, there are lots of people who preserve their fertility options, right? You free yeah. sperm, you like maybe get an egg donor, and like even making embryos, they could be <clears throat> frozen indefinitely. Right. So... There was something that felt really different about we have a surrogate. She's amazing. Her husband's amazing. We're doing this. The embryo's going in, you know, holy shit. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I think that's a good point because it's most straight couples who are going through this at any moment, the girl can walk in and be like, Hey, I want to use and fill out one of my embryos and put it in. Yeah. We have to be very strategic and have a team of people that sign off on it. I do. I mean, we have to have a surrogate, A, mm -hmm. and then we have to have a doctor and a lawyer and all the legal team to review it. Yeah. It's a very intentional and a process. But it's stressful. Like, I was just with someone the other day who he and his wife were trying for a really long time. They had a baby with IVF, and then they were sort of thinking about trying to have a second kid. She had been told she couldn't get pregnant naturally, and so she, one day basically was like I feel like I'm pregnant and she was like 20 weeks pregnant wow because she had just given up the thought of even thinking it so I don't know I just think that it's it's such an it's an intense process for people no matter who you are it can be stressful I think it's important for people to, to also know that you're not a very public person so that was an interesting thing that we had to work through in our relationship I feel like we've done a good job yeah you, me too you've made me better at pulling back and not being as open of a book. Well, I knew what I was signing up for and you've helped a lot of people by being public, uh, by documenting your coming out and now by being open about this. So I think there's a time and a place where being public is really great. Yeah. And then there are other times when it's like, let's just have that be our thing. Yeah. It's, been, I, it's worked really well. Yeah. So let's talk about the first day that we went in because I think there was a moment, a jarring moment for both of us. Where yeah. I, I've said this before, but we went through it. We get into this, you know, we get our, my sperm results to get yours. We freeze yours that day. We don't freeze mine because I have to improve, but then we get rushed over to this. Do you remember this? Um, notary public. We get uh, yeah, <clears throat> public notary. Yeah. We get rushed over into this like little room with a notary and they're like, here, sign this. And it's a book of papers. And on those papers, mm -hmm. <laughs> my little detail oriented stud, you went through meticulously every single well so did you yeah we were led through them by and it of course like california is a really good state for fertility and there are amazing pioneering people who have made this a really safe place to be able to build a family no matter what your family looks like and they've thought of stuff yeah and you know people take this really seriously and i think sometimes there's this misconception that it's like no one cares or some about like, Oh, you're just making an embryo and freezing it. And some people are feel really weird about the ethics of that. I actually was impressed by how thoughtful they were and, and how thoughtful the law is around that. Mm -hmm. so it was like, if something happens to you, Jordan and you know, but Colton survives, what happens to the embryos and like if vice versa, do you remember or, what all of our answers were for that? I think basically because I think it was so instinct instinctive, like, you know, we're trusting each other with yeah all of it. And then if, if, if it was like, if you both die, then it, I think it was like, you know, our parents could decide, but like, yeah. we're not going to have our yeah. parents raise random, like, well, yeah, they wouldn't even be, they would just be in, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. frozen somewhere. Totally. Um, but yeah, I remember it. It it was it is intense, and I think there's no way to not have it be intense. And everyone is really nice, but it is you sort of just have to like put on your your big boy pants and like go for it. Do a bunch of stuff that is uncomfortable. With and on the conversation of privacy and us being different people and how we operate, what all what all are we going to share? What are, what all are we going to talk about? 
I mean, we already have, we know our genders. You didn't have a list of questions or something? No, I didn't prepare anything for this. I just wanted to talk to you. <laughs> so. I'm happy to share anything. I don't have any, like, I think it's been beautiful. Um, I mean, I think, so, you know, you go into this clinical setting where everyone's really nice and you have to, like, go into a private room and, like, give a sperm sample. You know, yes, it was disappointing, I think, when you got that news that you had a low sperm count, but... He was, our doctor was so wonderful. He was like, there are things you can do. Four. Okay. That's not even low. That's like nothing. But, you know, in the same breath, he was like, don't worry about it. It's okay. This happens. There are things you can do to improve your sperm count and sperm health. And we learned about it. And there was a supplement you could take. And there were lifestyle changes you could make. And it works. Yeah. And he, uh, Dr. Ringler actually said something really interesting. He goes, it's really good for the other partner to be there. Because I, I remember, too, you held me very accountable. We made a lot of changes mm-hmm. for me. And you basically were just like, you're going to have to make some sacrifices in the short term. Yeah, but you did it on your own, too. I think you just, you, ever since I met you, you talked about wanting to become a father. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we froze our sperm. And then we looked at different agencies. Mm-hmm. We got so much advice from friends. And who were really great and said, let me sort of tell you the things I learned and the things that went wrong for me. And one friend recommended this um, concierge service called Donor Concierge. And we talked to them and they have relationships with many big agencies for both egg donors and surrogates. And so we hired them and then met with them to talk about the qualities we would want in an egg donor who's going to genetically be half of you know, these babies we bring into the world and raise. So it's like a really big decision. Yeah. Wait, I want to stop there. Yeah. I want to talk people through our process of selecting our egg donor. Great. And conversations we had. Because I think a lot of people are curious of like, is it a catalog? Is it a thing? And they have a lot of questions around that. And for, I mean, it essentially is a digital catalog of headshots. And when you click the headshot, it Mm -hmm. brings up a carousel of photos that has like a quick bio a medical history report, an education report. They're totally de-identified. Like yeah. They do a lot of work to protect the privacy of the women who are amazing and sort of offering this. Yeah, I think it's like the one, I don't even know the one that we went, it's like DCN014. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, you know, we, I think we're on similar pages, but yet different when we were like, what do we want out of an egg donor? Mm-hmm. I know like for you, health, And education were like two of your top priorities. Yeah, I think health. And I was always really interested in someone who seemed like curious about the world. Because I felt like if I, I, that's what I look for in a partner. Like, so somebody who, even if they couldn't afford to travel, like they'd either travel from where they were or if they couldn't afford to, said like, that's my dream that I want to do that someday. Sort of had like a personality of like explore and just being curious about the world and not somebody who's kind of like, yeah. Well, we both have that in common. Yeah. Just from our backgrounds and how we grew up. Yeah. And then I, I mean, for me, I obviously, yes, health and education were important, but they weren't like my top two. Mine were more height and physical attributes. Yeah. And I had to get confronted with that too. You sort of are confronted with your values because in your mind you're like, yeah, health and like the kid who's going to be really smart and healthy. And then you sort of, when you really, it really comes down to it and you're looking, you're like, can I picture having a baby with you, Mm. this person. And it's like, you know, and then we did give some feedback and said we're, you know, that was appearance based. Yeah. And it felt a little weird because it doesn't feel like the most politically correct thing, but I think we were really polite about it and sort of um, never rude about anyone else, but just saying like part of me felt like, you know, I would want to somehow be able to like, picture yeah you know like if i were i don't know how to explain it but it, it was like a more of a feeling if you were straight could you be in a relationship with a girl is that how you treated it more just like an x factor like it almost like it's so weird to say it like this but like on american idol when they'd be like you have the x factor or whatever it's like just you know you're just seeing a, a, a screenshot of someone like a photo yeah, yeah you don't you don't get to meet her in real life you don't get to see a video so it's more of like I mean, I guess you could also compare it a little bit to like dating apps where like obviously you're spending 
multiple minutes per profile and kind of reading about what these women have to say about why they're doing this, which in some cases is so moving. Yeah. And, um, but just, it comes down to this general feeling. And, and, and then I kind of gave myself the grace of like, I don't have to like explain it. I just, it's a yes or no. It's yeah. like a visceral kind of a thing. But we, when we found our first one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. The first one. She Let's talk really about that. Cool. Cause okay. we found the first one and then we went through everything and which by the way, you don't get to see a video. You don't get a ton of information, but when you do move forward with pursuing one, they do a due diligence and they, they provide you with even more information, the opportunity to request questions, the opportunity to request a video, potentially even zoom with her, mm -hmm. with her cameras off. Um, so we started pursuing it, but while they're, while we're pursuing all of that in the background, as Dr. Ringler said on his episode, they start the genetic testing then and there because they want to be able to like advise you actually, no, this, you guys shouldn't move forward based off your genetic. Yeah. And that happened for us. Yeah. So we had a very cool woman, um, who actually had a lot in common with the egg donor we ended up with, but had traveled a lot and was really, um, smart and seemed, I don't know, just really confident. Yeah. Which was, and then I found out that I was a carry, I, because we got genetic testing, mm -hmm. and then she and I were both carriers for cystic fibrosis. I know. Which was a small world because your foundation was set up to yeah. help people with cystic fibrosis. And so if she and I, if, if absent the genetic testing, if we had moved forward with her, our baby would have had a one in four chance of having this life-altering disease. Right. So we had to start over. We had to start over. And there were some that were just so cool. Yeah. I mean, and funny. Like, yeah. some of them were hilarious. I mean, some of the photos were me. Like, I mean, I you know. could just see their personality come through. And also, can we talk about some of the price tags? Yeah. They never Wild. were commensurate, I thought, with, like, like some of the women were like, you're the coolest woman I've ever seen. And her price would be, like, very low. Right. And then someone else, you're like, okay. And then it'd be, like, 300 grand. You're like, what? I know. And not, no knock, of course, but just sort of like, I mean, it's this weird marketplace. There's only one university that I kept seeing, <laughs> Notre Dame. Everybody from Notre Dame wanted to put four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 on their price tags. Hey, I was like, oof. You know what? If you can get it. It's Notre Dame. School's expensive. Notre Dame's amazing. No, I know, but it's like, I don't know, it's no Illinois State. <laughs> it's no um, Stanford. <laughs> Well, sorry to the people from Notre Dame. I think, I mean, I think Notre Dame, go fighting Irish. Um, <laughs> I didn't go there. I don't know why I care so much. Uh, then we found, yeah, I mean, it took us a while. It took us, that was the longest. It took months. Yeah. It took months to reset and refocus. And then we found a current egg donor. By the way, the, you, you can choose someone and they're like, sorry, she's not available anymore. Someone right. else chose her. Right, right, right. Or, um, you put, we put a hold on, she changed her mind. Yeah. She's in a relationship and her new partner is not comfortable. Yes. That came up. I forgot. Um, there's a few that got eliminated. So we, we, we went back with the top three and ranked them. Yeah. And then the number two, I think it got emailed to us. Actually, she changed the, her, she's now in a relationship and has removed herself from the database. Yeah. Which it's just such an evolving thing. And I remember being so moved by, this one woman um, who just seemed amazing. And I remember her, like her price was really low and she was married to a trans man. Yes. Yeah. And so they were going to, going to have to use, you know, fertility to have kids of their own. Right. And she didn't go into detail, but she said that was her motivation for becoming an egg donor is because she knows firsthand what it's like to have to do this. And she wanted to help other couples. Yeah. The women were amazing. I mean, full They're stop. The women who are like, you can, and of course it's a mixture of, you know, you're getting paid. So like, obviously there's a component of that, but there are lots of things you can do to make money. And I, I just was really moved by the way some of them spoke about why they were doing it. It was beautiful. And most of them had letters written. We actually prepared a letter. Yeah. I think we should talk about that too. Cause that was one thing that donor concierge had us do that. I don't think maybe a lot of agencies have you do, but I think you have to do it. Do you have to? A dear surrogate and dear egg donor. Yeah, before you, because yeah, to make sure both sides kind of match. So we used we we wrote a letter, um, just used aliases as our names so that we protected our identity. But um, no one cares who I am. But yeah, 
I used an alias. <laughs> Jordan kept his name the same. Um, and we wrote a letter and basically we're just like, had an opportunity before we even got to say hi to them to say thank you. Yeah. And we put thank you at the top of the, the letter. I'll have to find that because I think I want to read it for people to, yeah. to hear our letter. Um, and it's which, in the fertility folder on the desktop of our computer. Neatly organized so you can find it. Got it. You can tell that I did not make the <laughs> folders, nor do I use the desktop computer in our house. <laughs> you do more dishes than I do. I, we have our yeah, roles. Exactly. We, we play them well. Um, so anyway, yeah, we, we matched with our, our egg donor. One thing that was so cool, just like... You know, as much as a bummer and a letdown it was to have you match with our egg donor for cystic fibrosis and have to start over, mm-hmm. it was sort of cool to have the silver lining and be like, and I don't even, it was not even a silver lining, but like just have that moment where I was like, oh, this is full circle. Like yeah. I had a foundation that quite literally raised money and resources for people living with CF and now mm-hmm. I have to start over because of it. And I had this moment where I was going to a doctor's office at our doctor, a uh, doctor visit at, in the same building where our fertility doctor is. They strategically set these appointments up separately so that the intended parents do not ever run into the egg donor. I didn't find this out until I told this story, but it's a big deal. Like they don't, they hate that. Mm-hmm. So they said just to protect privacy, they yeah. do not want it. So anyway, I'm running late for my doctor's appointment. Somehow, some way I'm programmed to drive into their fertility parking lot instead of the cedar cyanide parking lot. So I'm already in the wrong place running late, have to take this elevator to a different floor than what it's supposed to go to. And I get into the elevator and there is our egg donor. Yeah. And she's going to her fertility appointment. I obviously just say hello. I do not say, well, you held the door for her on the elevator. I did. Didn't say a word other than hello and gave her a smile in the back of my mind. I'm like, this is so fucking cool. Mm hmm. And then you called me and just said, it feels like it felt it, re- right. It felt yeah. right. It felt real. It felt right. Cause I also think like there is a point where it's sort of like this unicorn mythological person mm-hmm. because you like select her and you have this team and you see her lab results and you see all like this data, mm-hmm. but you never actually get to see her. And I got to see her. Well, I think this is a good time to throw in ladies. We have to um, all fight on your behalf. Anybody who needs a sperm donor, I should say, um, when you get an egg donor, you get to see these women as babies, little kids, teenagers, young adults, like every phase of their life. Mm -hmm. But women who want sperm donors are not getting that. They just get baby pics. Right. And we're going to get into that. So they could get in an elevator with their sperm donor. I have no idea. Right. (laughs) And we're going to get into that in a later episode, too, and elaborate more on that. But it is a little backwards. That, like that's still the case. Some agencies are changing, mm-hmm. but yeah, we'll get more into that because something's got to change there. I'm sure it's because men don't want to provide, you know, photos of themselves as adults. They want anonymity. Yeah. Um, and egg donors get paid much, much more than sperm donors. So maybe it all just comes down to capitalism, but yeah. Oh, how you want to get into capitalism on this podcast? No, just like if you're getting paid 50,000 bucks, like maybe you're more willing to give a photo of yourself than if you're getting paid like 500 bucks. Yes. Yeah. For sure. Um, what else? Yeah. So the, I mean, the egg donor was amazing, like more educated than both of us probably combined. So then we get into our egg donor goes in for her retrieve. Uh, actually we have to talk about this. And the decision that we made. Mm-hmm. So midway through the process, our egg donor wrote us a letter basically saying like, Hey, this is much harder than I anticipated. Emotionally. Emotionally. Yeah. I was not prepared for this. I don't really want to do this anymore. And for that reason, like I, I s- sort of undervalued myself and this entire process and asked for more money. Mm-hmm. I don't want to just like lazily say, she asked us for more money. How did like that? No, it was a really attitude. heartfelt letter. Right. And, but the agency was really like kind of mortified to send it to us. They said, we've, this is very unusual. You have a contract that your lawyers review. There's a legal agreement. You're not obligated to do this. We're, you know, we're sorry to even send it to you. And we read it and it was like very human. It was just like a person being like, I'm going through this and here's how I'm feeling about it. And I think right away, yeah, she asked for more money and not, 
in the grand scheme of things, not a ton. Right. Um, but we, I think both Im- almost immediately d- wanted to do it because look again, it's like this really beautiful human thing. And it's also like money changing hands. So those things are constantly clashing. I just think it's, it's important to highlight like the hu- our decision was not made off of dollar amounts and our decision was not made off of what our lawyers were advising us or the doctors were saying or the agencies were saying it was basically off of the human element of yeah. like, we can't imagine what she's going through right now. We are so incredibly thankful to her. And yes, here's the money. Let's keep moving forward. And it hits everyone differently. We, you know, we know some people who've done egg donation before. They're like, I do it a hundred. It was no big deal. I didn't care, whatever. I mean, the hormones thing I think is intense, but I think for other people, it's like really intense emotionally. Like I will, this, there's a person that's going to be out there who's half me who I won't know. Right. I don't really know these people who are going to be raising that child. Are they going to do a good job? You know? And it's like, it's, in, it's intense. Yeah. Well, there's other animals in our animal kingdom that aren't great parents. I mean, some species eat their own. <laughs> so, I mean, for example, for example, <laughs> Do you know any of the animals that I'm talking about? I think a lot do it. Like it's the weakest so weird. one. Yeah, the weakest one always gets to get like more nutrition for the surviving. I mean, evolution is savage. Yeah, savage. Evolution is savage, but it works. Um, Wait, so then what? So then she goes in for her egg retrieval. <clears throat> yeah, and we get the call, or we log into our portal, mm-hmm. and we see we have 22 eggs. Yeah, and then from there, we split them 11 and 11. Yep. You. We use your sperm on your 11. We use my sperm on my 11. And then we get to track them over eight days. Was it five? I think five. But it was also like, it's always everything with us, with our fertility is like on a Friday. And they're like, well, we don't know over the weekend. So you're like, okay, great. We just found out this really important thing on like Friday at 4 p.m. And now we have to wait till Monday to get a call. So as we're following in our portal and as lab results are coming back, we're like slowly seeing our embryos get eliminated. Yeah. I mean, we, we see out of our not out of our 11, nine moved on. Then out of that, you know, day by day, they're sort of getting eliminated to like the last day where they need to take three more days to mature. And then you get to see how many embryos you have. And do you want to share the end results? Well, yeah, I mean, so we sent, I think it's like, even from there, it's two stages because we sent eight to genetic testing. Yeah. Which I think they're like packed on dry ice or something. I remember they were shipped to like Alabama or something from LA. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't follow that. And they get genetically tested. And from there, the ones that went into like frozen storage, it was only three. So five didn't really make it. But somebody, I can't remember if it was our doctor or like a friend, explained it to me in a way that felt comforting. They said like, those are the ones that, like when a woman is pregnant and has a miscarriage, mm-hmm. like that's what, it would have been like a miscarriage. Yeah. Which would have been hard on. Yeah. Obviously our surrogate, hard on us. Well, everyone, yeah. And you just, yeah. So and I that, think it also just underscored like how miraculous life is. Mm, yeah. You start out with, you know, this much and you go down this much and at really, every stage really shows you how, like how much goes into a birth and how much has to go right every day I to know. like grow a human inside another human. Yeah. I'm honored to do it with you. Same. All right. So then we get into the process of sitting with our three embryos in which we're keeping to ourselves right now. This is the privacy and Mm. um, boundaries that I've learned. We are protecting, sort of just keeping the gender to ourselves right now. Um, So we have three embryos, which grades were, I found out. So we have two of the highest grades Mm. and then one was an AB. Oh. Um, But all great in like the grand scheme of things. Great. Like AB is like just one notch down from like perfect. Got it. From what I've understand. Um, To lining up our surrogate. So 
I don't know if people know this, but right now in our country, there is a pretty high demand for surrogates, which means there is a line yeah. to get in. Oh, yeah. Um, we were on the wait list for about six months. We As soon as we started our egg donor contract and going down that road, we actually put our names in for the wait list for our surrogate. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this because we go through this process. We get matched with one. She's in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And we get all excited. We're like, finally, Vegas will be fun. Although I kind of was like, I never wanted to have a surrogate that we would have to get on an airplane right. to go see. Cause, and that but was you take what you can get. More advice. Like, it was, again, more advice that people were like, you want to be able to get there if something unexpected comes up. Right. Vegas wasn't the worst for us, though. It's a 45 minute flight. Yeah. Four hour drive. Yeah. At the end of the day, we could have gotten through. We that. could have, but I was holding out. Anyway, it didn't matter because fate worked in our favor. And unfortunately, their BMI was too high by the time they went in for testing and evaluation. Yeah. So we get rematched. And then. <laughs> well, not matched. It's well, so that it's different from. So whereas egg donors, you're getting sent any women who are available who meet what sort of the parameters you're looking for. With surrogates, it was different, right? Remember, we they would offer us one person at a time, and we had 24 yeah. hours to say yes or no. Yes. So we had said yes to Vegas, and they're like, she's not available. And then the second one they offered us, she was four feet eleven inches. I'm six two. You're six four. This so we politely baby is not going to be small. <laughs> Our egg donor was quite tall. I think yeah. five ten or a, yeah, her like dad, pretty tall. Her dad's like six four. So the idea of this baby, it could be a nine or ten pound baby. And that just felt kind of mean to do to someone who's four feet, 11 inches. Could have broken the vagina. I think, I don't know. Yeah, anyway, we have, said no politely. Yeah. We just said after reviewing some information, we do not feel like this is a great match. I, I think we said, we think she's too yeah, small. And I think they agreed. Yeah. They were like, yeah, kind of. We, I think they were like, we didn't notice her height. Yeah. And then we found our third time a charm, sweet woman. Oh. An angel. Angel by. Yeah. We're very, very excited to have her on board. Mm -hmm. We're also very protective over her and privacy wise. Yeah. But I also, I wasn't ready. I never, it never occurred to me that it mattered who the surrogate's partner was. Hmm. But that's a really important part of it that we learned about, right? Yeah. It was like the husband or, you know, sometimes the wife. Yeah. If yeah. it's a lesbian couple. Yeah. They, or some of them are not married, but like they just have to make sure they have a really good support system. Right. That they're not being subjected to physical or emotional abuse. Yep. They also have to have one proven birth. Right. Which we didn't know. Yeah. And what else? It was like, yeah. And they, but they do a lot of health testing on the partner yeah. of the surrogate. Mental health screening. And making sure there's no like STIs and like, um, yeah. Other diseases. Cause like theoretically, like, you know, the yeah. surrogate is going to be having sex with their partner throughout the pregnancy and right. like, make sure that, like, the baby is not impacted. Yeah. You, we learned a lot. So and then we picked her, and then it was still, like, forever. Everything Mock just took so long. Data. Well, I, it was good to hear Dr. Ringler say they're working on that. Oh, really? Because what they found in studies is it discourages people to do this. Oh, yeah. It's so discouraging the longer you have to wait. But I will say, like, it's been two years. We've been on this journey for two years. A year and a half. Right? Wasn't it June 2022? I'll have to look. Oh, that's the first time we went in. Okay. Yeah. Still, a long time. Yeah. Um, all right. We'll get back into our story later on another episode. Okay. But right now... It wouldn't be a Colton Underwood podcast without a trivia section. Competition. Who goes first? Well, you can begin. Okay, so we're playing a game to test each other's baby knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. Um, okay. When should solid foods typically be introduced? Wait, I can't. Don't. Don't. You got to hide it from here or else I'll cheat. When should solid foods typically be introduced to a baby's diet? Well, if it was up to Jordan Brown, it would be almost immediately because you want them to teeth. But I will say four months. The answer is around six months of age. Six months. Yeah. What do you think about that? That seems about right. 
They had their own breast milk for a while. So six more formula. So I didn't get it right. Yeah, it's an X. I'm putting an X. Okay. Okay, question number one for you. When do babies usually start crawling? You can hit the, there's a range. So okay. as long as you hit a number in that range. I would say around 10 months. Yeah, seven to 10. You barely got it, but you got it. Yeah. Good job. Thanks. Uh, name three essential items that are typically found in a diaper bag. You have to name three. Diaper, baby wipe, um, powder, baby powder. No. The, the first two are right, but you can maybe have a couple other guesses to okay. get a third that's on the list. I'm for sure putting baby powder in our... In our powder? Room. Yeah, to powder their bottoms so they don't get diaper rash. No one does that. I think it's all cream now. Oh, it's diaper like a, cream. I mean, probably yes, but I gave you that one. So do you have a third? <laughs> Diapers, wipes, and what's the third? Um, a blanket. A, a bottle. Um, a bottle would be in there. Yes. I was looking for pacifier or changing mat. Pacifier. I'm going to give it to you. Okay, thank you. Here we go. What is the average weight of a newborn baby in pounds? I'm going to give you a range, too. I'm going to do a pound below and a pound above, so as long okay. as you're in that. Um, I would say... The average is probably like six pounds, nine ounces. You're in it. It's 7.5 on the average. So anything from 6.5 to 8.5 would have been right. Good job, babe. Thanks. Okay. What is... My little Stanford guy. <laughs> okay. What is the purpose of a baby monitor? This is a gimme. To tell if they're awake? Actually, or if they're crying? No. I mean... To uh, hear if they're crying. To like help them. To monitor the baby's activity, sounds, and movements when you're not in the same room. Avery, we need to talk. No, he got that one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. How often is it recommended to burp a new newborn after feeding? Is it a multiple choice? No. How often or like how many times? How often is it? It's like a weird question. Like how many times are you supposed to burp the baby after you feed the baby? Yeah. Twice, three times. The answer is every two to three ounces during bottle feeding or when switching breasts during breastfeeding. I think I got it. You don't get it. Yes, I do. That was a... No, nope. I'm not giving it to you. I got that. Like a few times. No, I missed one, so you missed one. What is the importance of tummy time for an infant? Uh, to build the neck muscles. Partially correct. To learn... No, no, what other muscles? Oh, the back and the spine and the abs. <laughs> the abs. No, it's the neck, shoulder, and arms. <laughs> Your baby's going to have abs. True or false? 50-50 chance. Newborns can see colors from birth. False. How did you know that? I've heard it. Yeah, false. Newborns initially see the world in black and white. Also, they, yeah, they seem a little bit blind when they're like really new. They're like, they can't really tell. What are they like, like my little, my first nephew, when he would wake up, would like put his mouth on my nose because he thought it was a bottle. And I'm like, are you good? <laughs> <laughs> That's my nose. But it was cute too. I can't wait for a baby. Um, true or false? Latch onto your nose. <laughs> ba true or false? Babies are born with kneecaps. False. I think it forms just like the skull is like shaping and forming. Correct. Yes. Babies are born with cartilage in their knees, but the kneecap develops over time. Amazing. You're, are, you done, are you out? No, I have one more for you. Oh, okay. Me too. Jordan, at what age do most babies start teething? Oh, I mean, I really don't know. Five months, six months? Yeah. There, it was that was the first question on my list, but I didn't give it to you because you opened with the solid food, so I thought you would correlate oh. it to the same thing. Oh. You got that right. So you only missed one. Okay, you. I have one more for you. Okay, what is the average number of diapers a newborn goes through in a day? In a day? Mm-hmm. Newborn. Five. That's incorrect. Six. No. Seven. Nope. Eight. Yeah, eight to twelve. What? Yeah. 
It's a lot of diapers you're going to have to change. Okay, you got four out of six correct. How many did I get? Um, four out of five. No, there's you answered. You weren't, didn't you have six for me too? I only had five for you. Oh, I guess I went first. So I think I win. Great. Whatever. Thanks for having me. The ride of your life is Daddyhood.